Hi folks, this is Abel James, and thanks so much for listening to the Fat Burning Man Show, where we talk about real food and real results. Today's special guests are Mira and Jason Calton, authors of Naked Calories and a brand spanking new Rich Food, Poor Food. Featuring forwards from our friends Dr. William Davis of Wheat Belly, as well as Mark Sisson from The Primal Blueprint. Now before we get to the show, I got some killer news that totally caught me off guard. Actually, it was one of our loyal listeners, Mr. Dan, who sent me a Wired magazine article that features Fat Burning Man in the same breath as Tim Ferriss and a bunch of other dabblers in biohacking and cold thermogenesis specifically. For a geek like me, being featured in Wired magazine is pretty much like the best thing on earth. Totally nerd nirvana. So if you haven't checked out the article, make sure to go take a look. I think you can get right to it at the Wired magazine website. And for a limited time, if you hop on over to fatburningman.com and sign up for my email list, then I'll be sending you the Primal Rockstars ebook featuring Mark Sisson, Rob Wolf, Dave Asprey, and a few other folks totally for free. So stop on by and check it out. All right, so in today's show with Mira and Jason Calton, we talk about how you can find the highest quality real foods in the average supermarket. We unveil key deceptive marketing tactics used by food manufacturers to trick you into thinking that their food is healthy. And of course, we talk about how Mira developed advanced osteoporosis with the bone density of an 80-year-old woman at the ripe age of 30 and outline what you can do to prevent a similar fate. All right, let's go hang out with Mira and Jason. Mira and Jason Calton are the authors of the best-selling Naked Calories, as well as the brand spanking new Rich Food, Poor Food. How's it going, guys? It's going great. <laughs> Excellent. Awesome. I hear you're shivering up there in New York right now, wishing you were in Florida. Absolutely. We're excited to go home. There's not a lot of television to be done in Florida, though, so we kind of have to keep coming up to New York, and I grew up here, so I like being home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> New York is definitely the only place on the planet that's like New York. Every time I'm, I'm there, I feel like I need to take a three-day nap. <laughs> it's intense. <Absolutely. laughs> so you guys were actually some of the first guests ever on my show, but a lot has happened since then. You just cranked out a new awesome book that we were just talking about, I think is going to have a wider audience than just kind of the ancestral health paleo folks, uh, which is really exciting. But for those people out there who don't know you, can you each just give a, a brief background of, of how you got to where you are today? Sure. Um, well, Naked Calories starts with um, me being ill. Basically, I was diagnosed with advanced osteoporosis at 30 and had to sell my company and leave New York City. And basically, it started on a journey of trying to reverse my health condition, reverse my bone condition by um, proper lifestyle and diet. Uh, it took about two years in. I met Jason, who was already working with clients for over a decade. We started looking at the micronutrients, the vitamins and minerals, and the essential fats. Mm -hmm. We redid my diet, completely added a supplementation, and within two years, we reversed my bone condition 100%. So I'm happy to say I'm free of osteoporosis now <laughs> for many years. And um, that really was why we wrote Rich Food Poor Food, was to explain to people the importance of micronutrient deficiency, how mm -hmm. widespread that pandemic is globally, and the three-step approach that we sort of reversed my condition with in order to um, become micronutrient sufficient. Right. Yeah, when I, when I first met Mira, of course, I was a, a nutritionist, and I was working on what we call the macronutrient wars. I was part of that group who was you know, an early pioneer in the very low-carb and zero-carbohydrate dieting uh, that was going on back in the, the 90s. I started in about 1990 with that philosophy. But wow. when Mira came into my office, she wasn't, it wasn't about the carbs, the fats, or the proteins, any of those macronutrients that she was deficient in. She was really deficient in the micronutrients. Mm -hmm. And that's what started me on the journey to look at the other side of food, the side of food that I think a lot of nutritionists just kind of just skate over or don't get enough of. Um, so what we did is we were able to reverse Mira's osteoporosis. Of course, we went on the Colton Project. For those who don't know, that was the six-year, 100-plus country uh, research expedition where we lived with remote tribes around the world to study li uh, nutritional and lifestyle habits. Making everyone to... jealous on the way, too. Well, no. It, well, I mean, there was a lot of work. I mean, while it was an amazing adventure, you know, there was a lot of work there. And, we, and what we basically found out from that, it all boils down to one basic sentence. Micronutrient deficiency is the most widespread and dangerous 
dangerous health condition of the 21st century. Yeah. And that's because most of us are walking around with deficiencies in our essential micronutrients that we don't even know we have. So that was that was naked calories. That All that information is in there. Then we started getting emails and phone calls and letters and saying, you know, hey, that's great. I can eat local food. I can eat grass-fed meat. I can eat pasture-raised chicken. But what about in all the other aisles of the grocery store? What about in the cereal aisle, the rice aisle, the ice cream, the candy bars? Are there rich foods there too? So we said, hey, let's write a grocery store guide where we can actually highlight the foods that are the highest in micronutrient value, but also do something else. We add a food quality component so that you avoid what we call poor food ingredients or ingredients that can be potentially dangerous to our overall health. And that was the birth of rich food, poor food. Very cool. And it's a, it's not an easy task, especially when you're in a traditional supermarket looking for anything that's remotely nutritious. No, <laughs> so. there's 40,000 items in the average grocery store. So if you can imagine how many grocery stores we went to, that tells you how many products we looked at. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it's a big undertaking. It was a daunting task. Yeah. But before we get there, um, Mira, one of the most interesting things about your story, and it kind of parallels my own in a sense, is that you you got to be super unhealthy by doing things that conventional wisdom tells you are very healthy, right? Like eating, what was it, a spinach salad every day? Totally. I used to love spinach salad. I had no idea about oxalic acid and how it was actually robbing me of micronutrients. I was a cardio freak. Yeah. I loved taking hip hop class. So I would go to like dance class like once in the morning and once in the afternoon, you know, whenever I could fit it in because I just wanted to be that supermodel skinny in Manhattan. <laughs> And didn't realize that that was actually, you know, burning up so many micronutrients. Remember, when you sweat, that's the same micronutrients that you yeah. need to run your body. So I was doing all these things, you know, conventional conventional wisdom said it was smart, and I ended up paying the price of um, of being becoming really sick. Yeah, and you counted calories as well, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Everything was low calorie. I mean, literally, I had the low fat muffin for breakfast because I thought it was better. Meanwhile, it was just wheat and sugar. Mm -hmm. And then I would basically, you know, for lunch I had my salad, but of course a no fat dressing because, you know, God forbid I was I was gonna actually get some fat to help my, you know, fat soluble vitamins actually absorb into my body. <laughs> yeah. And dinner was, you know, it was always Chinese food, reheated, reheated, and reheated with no fat on it, just cooked in chicken broth. Yeah. So yeah, it was I look back at it now and I could not eat a more different diet today. <laughs> yeah, totally. All right. So for you, I'm sure. Absolutely. My diet or my nutrition plan, and I talk about this all the time, is so easy now because it's so delicious. It was really hard to try to be healthy in the traditional way of being healthy, which is, you know, watching nutrition labels like a hawk and eating a lot of foods out of boxes and making sure there's no fat in them and like sponging off the top of your pizza to get all the fat off with napkins. It's just, just absolutely absurd and not delicious at all. Yeah. Exactly. Now we take the bottom off the pizza. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know, right? Yeah, and now it's just a completely 180 compared to what I used to do. Um, yeah. If I met myself, you know, five... Ten years ago, now I would I would freak myself out in a huge way. I meet right. myself all the time because so many women write into me, mm -hmm. and they they'll send me what they're doing because so many people know the story of osteoporosis, and it, it is it's like looking in a mirror constantly. I got an email from a woman in Korea who basically is me. I mean, I was looking; wow. she's like totally addicted to all the same exact yeah. things, and you know, I'm writing back and forth with her, trying to help her. But it's um, it's really amazing. There's a lot of people making those same mistakes even today. All right. So, Mira, talking to your past self who's walking into a supermarket right now, completely clueless about, you know, what's what's best for her health. What what should she do next? What's what's the rich food, poor food approach? Well, we have to look at rich food in, with two distinct things. First, increase micronutrient value. Second, decrease the potential for dangerous ingredients. So that's what you should always be considering when choosing a food. And the only place to find out that information is going to be to actually pick up the box, turn it around, and to read the ingredients list. Mm -hmm. Because that's really where you're going to find out if there's anything hiding in there that you don't want or any micronutrient depleting ingredients. There's a lot of ingredients in foods that people don't realize actually rob you of micronutrients. Right. Um, so we want to make sure that we're always looking for those things if, you know, in order to make sure we're still getting in all the vitamins and minerals that we need. Yeah. And it's really important to note, too, that most foods, if not all of foods, have good things about them and bad things about them. Right? Like Absolutely. A, a spinach yeah. salad, for example. There are certain instances where that could be appropriate and, and definitely inappropriate in some other ones. 
Yeah, I think that that's one of the things that's, that's so difficult about nutrition is that you can't necessarily tell just by looking at a food if it's healthy or not healthy. Like on the cover of our book, Mira and I are standing there. I'm tossing up an apple and she's holding some eggs. But you can't tell by looking at that apple and those eggs whether those are rich foods or poor foods. Mm -hmm. They're real foods, but that apple could be sprayed with 42 different pesticides. It could yeah. have been grown in soil with depleted of micronutrients. So those eggs could have been from a factory farm chicken so, you know, that was fed GMO soy and corn and, and, and was also fed arsenic. So, you know, that's what's difficult. You, you know, the American population really needs to be educated as to the difference between rich food and poor food. And that's where the ingredient list and that's where a book like Rich Food, Poor Food can really come in handy because it yeah. isn't just as easy as going in the grocery store and just buying, you know, real food. Yeah, it's funny too. Actually, one, one rule that I follow myself, I've found that the weirder a food looks, like a tomato, for example, those weird looking heirloom tomatoes, uh, the better it is for you and the better it tastes, usually the fresher it is. I was thinking, um, growing up in New Hampshire in my backyard, we had a bunch of different fruit trees, apple, peach, pear, and those things were not pretty but man, were they delicious? They were yeah. absolutely because what because people just want to like make everything look so perfect and shiny. And yeah. first of all, fruit doesn't come off the tree shiny, folks. <laughs> you know that's wax. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of things like nothing looks perfect in nature, and and that's what we have to understand. You know, if a bug, you know, if you now it's kind of crazy. If I bite into a salad and I find a little green worm, I'm stoked. Yeah, because that means that means that it's safe lettuce. The right. worm likes it. I should do. Yeah. But, One other thing I use is my dog. <laughs> like yeah. if my dog sniffs something and she won't touch it, it's like, huh, that's yeah. kind of interesting, right? Because they don't care about how good an apple or a piece of meat looks. They care about how it smells. Yeah. Um, and, and that's one of the things about GMO um, foods that they've actually shown that animals will not eat that until they get really, really hungry. Like yeah. when given the option, you can put two things in front of a healthy animal and they will always go towards the, the fruit or vegetable or whatever it is that is not genetically modified. And that should be telling us something. Yeah, absolutely. I remember this picture that went around the, the paleosphere a few months ago of, uh, I think it was margarine versus a real butter with just ants. It was sitting outside. <laughs> and there were like three dead ants on the margarine and the butter was just covered with all these ridiculously happy ants. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that was one of the big surprises, too, when we traveled, you know, deep, deep inside the Amazon. And, you know, it took us hours by boat and then three hours by paddling. And and we get there and these people are standing around. They're cooking their manioc and they're, you know, they're half naked and they pull out a tub of margarine. I'm like, where in the world did you get that? It was like, oh, we traded it for coconut oil. And I mean, it's great. Oh, no. It stays, you know, it never spoiled. We just put it on everything. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Yeah. You know, something is very wrong here. Yeah. So. I feel like the supermarket, the grocery store is kind of a, a bit of sea of deception, right? What are some of the things that people can do to get past all of that shady marketing and, and get to the truth? Well, we, we teach something in the book called the divide and conquer uh, method. And so we want to teach you, start. we start off at the basic level. Let's start to how to read a food label. What is the front of a box or bag or you know grocery store item really designed to do? It's designed to make you buy the product. It's going to be full of all kinds of marketing jargon and promises and flashy messages and bright colors and fun characters, all designed to do, to do one thing, make you buy that food. So we need to get past that. We need to get past even... The, the nutrition label, you know, nutrition labels are great. It can tell you if it's a low-fat food or a low-carb food or a high-protein food, but that's it. It just tells the numbers. It can't tell you if a food is a rich food or a poor food. Mm -hmm. You have to get past all of that, and you have to get to the ingredient list, and you have to start to read the ingredient list. You have to become aware of what those ingredients are and what they mean and where they come from and how they affect you, and that's what we really want to teach in Rich Food, Poor Food. We start off you know, slow and easy. The book's divided into two, to two sections. We take you through all the ingredients first, and not in a way that we want you to memorize them or anything, but it's a reference guide. We want to introduce you to them, and then we take you down aisle by aisle, and as you go down those aisles, you become more and more accustomed to seeing the, what we call the poor food ingredients. And so when you're in your regular grocery store and you see those on the label, you're going to be aware immediately, hey, that's one of those poor food ingredients that they call and say stay away from. Mm -hmm. And it just becomes second nature over time. Yeah, it definitely takes practice, doesn't it? Uh, one of yeah. the things um, going through your book that, that I appreciated was looking at Lay's, uh, classic versus baked. And <laughs> yeah, so, that's, that's a shocker. <laughs> yeah, totally crazy, right? And they, they take 
all of these very subtle marketing messages and, and kind of infuse them into the product packaging and the product itself. So can you talk about that, uh, the dichotomy between those two, I guess, approaches to their brand? Yeah, it was very interesting. This has actually happened to us when we were a grocery store. We first started looking at the products, and that's why we used the example in the book. Um, everybody knows there's Lay's and then there's baked Lay's. Now, the regular Lay's is in a bright yellow package. It says classic. You know exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. And then the new Lay's is in this soft package with warm hues. And now it says all natural, no MSG, no preservatives. And like it's trying to tell you like, oh, my God, our old product must have really stunk mm -hmm. because this one's all <laughs> natural. They, we got rid of all that stuff. So from the front of the package or the billboard, as we call it, you would think that the um, baked Lay's is a better, healthier choice. And then you turn it over, and then if you look at just the nutrition facts, you'll see that they've lowered the fat, and they've taken out all the saturated fat, and they've lowered the calories. And if that's really the stuff that you know intrigues you, then that's where you'd stop looking. And that's where rich food, um, that's where we're different than the other swap guys, because eat this, not that, stops there. Mm -hmm. And because all they care about is the fat and the sodium. And they actually said about this product that it was their, by and far, best choice for a potato chip because oh, that's, no. that's where they stopped looking. But then the problem is if you go to where we tell you to go, which is the third step, which is the ingredients list, you'll see that you went from just having three ingredients in the classic chips. It was just potatoes, oil, and salt. And now in the new ones, you've got dried potato and cornstarch and sugar and corn oil and salt and soy lecithin and corn sugar. You've now added in all of these GMOs. You've added in numerous forms of sugar. And you're not even using real potato. It's just a dried potato flake now. <laughs> so what you see is that they're trying to tell you that it was worse. It's, it was, you know, they've become more natural when, in fact, they've just become a Franken chip. Yeah. So it's really it just shows you that really the last bastion of hope is that ingredients list. You do not know what you're getting until you get all the way down to the specifics of how a food has been created. Right. And it's almost like the healthier a food appears, the the more ridiculous the ingredients are. Exactly. They're trying to sell you healthy. They don't even know what you're looking for, what's making up health. And that's what's so, you know, difficult is that they're assuming what you want it, what you want to be healthy. And I guess they're assuming that only fat grams counts as health. Yeah. What we're trying to show people is if you really look at what you're going to get, how do you get health? You get health by two things, increasing micronutrients and decreasing dangerous ingredients. Yeah. So that's exactly what we tell people to do in the book. Yeah. And it's such a, it's a troubling approach. And I feel this all the time when I'm looking at product packaging. Um, it, it just plays a mind game when you see something that doesn't contain something free of x free of y free of z and you're like oh this is healthy but like when you're eating something you're supposed to be extracting nutrients from that food and it's not healthy because of what is not in it and that's one of the approaches i think that's just a red flag right like if you see something like that on a package and it's bragging about how healthy it is because of all the things it doesn't contain usually that's a little bit curious yeah, it, it is. And a lot of times what they'll do is they'll put things on the package that it never contained. You know, they'll have fruit mm. juice and be like, fat free. Well, it <laughs> never had any fat. I know, that's it's, you know, and it's so great, you know, but mm -hmm. it's, it's all there to try to fool you and to trick you, you know, to go with the buzzwords that we're being brainwashed to believe are good for us here in America. I mean, you know, we think that low calorie food is good. Who said low calorie food is good? I mean, I happen to think that eggs and coconut oil and meat and all this are some of the healthiest foods on the planet. And they're certainly not low calorie. What do I care about calories if I'm eating quality, healthy foods? Yeah. It, you know, low fat, low fat. Fat is not fat is not a problem mm -hmm. when we eat the man, you know non man made fats healthy fats. In fact, fat like Mira said, fat can help us to absorb our fat soluble vitamins that are so important for overall health. Yeah, and they usually add in gums. I mean, that's the crazy right. thing is what they're putting in instead of the fat is just so bad for you. And they're micronutrient robbers. I mean, all those gums actually pull the micronutrients right out of your body. So. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's like trading something good for something, you know, with double the bad bad things in it. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. And the whole approach to marketing is fascinating, too. When, uh, you know, I go and get Kerrygold butter quite often because it's, it's easy to find. Um, and when, yeah. you, when you see some of the American companies that are 
advertising grass fed or pasture raised it's emblazoned all over everything with exclamation points and flashy colors with Kerrygold, it's <laughs> you have to flip it over on the back and it's just like in ireland we yeah. raise cows on pastures and they eat grass <laughs> it generally it's the same thing with butter with cheese we tell people yeah. all the time you know you could find the Ameri- the one brand which actually we love rumiano cheeses they are doing it right but there's so you can just go to the, any foreign cheese in your art in your in your what we call the fancy cheese se- fancy cheese section, mm-hmm. and all of these countries aren't using our BGH because it's not legal there. Right. So I mean, it's always and it's very sad thing that we have to look to other countries to find better products. But it's a great tip for people who are out there, you know, in search of. Yeah, that's a fair point, and I think that gets to a deeper issue in all of this, which is the uh, unwarranted trust of the American public in food manufacturers and in the food around them and restaurants and and supermarkets. Can you talk a little bit about that? Just, uh, and and I had this misplaced trust as well for many years, as I'm sure you did, Mira. Can you talk about how (laughs) that might be misplaced? Oh, absolutely. You know, you think that you're listening to the right people because it's all on the news and it's in the commercials and it's your doctor's office. And it's all these people telling you that a certain message of what's healthy. Um, Luckily today we are seeing that we're changing that message. And little by little, you know, we're able to get it out. We're shocked now because we, um, because we're on Fox now so regularly. They are actually, we keep expecting them to cringe when we're saying our message. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have to tell you, and this nobody knows because we don't talk about it on air. They are all on low carb paleo programs. Yeah. <laughs> which none of them are talking about, but it's really interesting. You go back there, and they're all eating hard boiled eggs mm-hmm. in the green room. Right. So it's really cool that they're, you know, when we got out there the other day and we said, don't eat wheat for cereal, it's bad for you, they didn't blink. So I guess my hope is that it really will become more mainstream and the more of us who speak out to a broader audience mm-hmm. um, will be able to make it so that there is a voice of reason out there, not just saying saturated fat is bad, not just saying to go for low fat, you know, low fat foods for diet and, you know, mm-hmm. and to lower your cholesterol by, you know, only eating grains. Um, you know, there's, there's more of us talking about it now. And we really do think that we are going to be able to start this, what we call the rich food revolution, mm-hmm. um, trying to get this message out from people like you and through us. That's awesome. That's a really good point too. The more I meet people who are, you know, fitness models, celebrities, people who are in the, the public eye, the more of them I find are like secretly low carb paleo, <laughs> even though they, they never talk about it. It's something that many of them do on purpose. And a lot of them do just because they know it kind of keeps them keeps them lean. Right. I mean, we've all been, I mean, we, anybody who's 30 plus years old have been, has been around through America's, you, you know, cr- you know, diet <laughs> crazes, right? So yeah. we've been through, we've starved ourselves to death. We've eaten bo- copious bowls of, of cabbage soup. We, <laughs> we've tried, you know, all these different things that have come along the way. And what we've learned is that we've just starved ourselves to death. And, all, and while we lose weight and we look you know, fine for pictures as long as we're airbrushed and, and it's not, you know, we don't stay on these diets too long. At the end of the day, they're just unrealistic, you know, dietary philosophies that lead us to more sickness and high cholesterol and you know, bad skin. You know, we have bad yeah. skin and we don't sleep well and, you know, bad tempers and hormone imbalances. And so, you know, we've, we've kind of been duped again and again and again in this country as far as how, what healthy is. And we've been mm-hmm. fooled into thinking that thin is healthy. And it's just not. Thin is starved. You know, we want to be fit. We don't want, we want, you know, we have good lean muscle tissue. We want, yeah, we want to keep our body fat in check. But ultimately, we want a realistic and sustainable lifestyle program that will keep us healthy and will not make us have all these these, these health conditions and diseases that were, that are plaguing America today. Absolutely. One One cool thing I can say about the book is like, you know, we've been trying to try to get this message across to so many people. And while a lot of us are really, you know, have a lot of knowledge in this area, in this arena, um, we all have friends and we all have family that don't want to hear our lectures about, you know, why certain foods are good for you and the fact that these certain foods should never be eaten. I'll tell you, we have been, we love the welcome we're getting with Rich Food, Poor Food because we are not a diet in any way. Mm -hmm. I don't care what diet you follow and you can tell your mom. It doesn't matter what diet you're following. The fact is, this can be used because it goes into every single aisle of the grocery store and just helps them make better decisions. Does it help them make paleo decisions and primal decisions? Yes. But we don't necessarily need to sh- shove the message down anyone's sure. throat. We can really just say, you know what, this is just going to tell you what products to buy. Mm-hmm. And I think it's 
really easy for people to use because they can just go to the grocery store, choose better products, and see their food and see their health improving in a way that doesn't seem overwhelming for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, that's, I think that's the 80 20 secret, maybe not quite. 80%, but just switching from fake foods to real foods, no matter what sort of dietary dietary framework you're following, is the key. You know, going from all of that nonsense on the ingredients list back to actual real ingredients that should be making up the food gets people from a state of having all sorts of crazy health problems to usually kind of regulating. And then once your body self-regulates and gets rid of all that junk that they're putting in the foods, you start absorbing nutrition again. And that's so important for all of this. Yeah, I mean, it, it is true. And we even, you know, we want to still make a point, though, you know, while we do want to get people to those real foods, we want to take them all the way to the rich foods. We don't just yeah. want to get stopped there with rich food, with real food, because, you know, like I said, there's a lot of still very negative consequences to eating the wrong kinds of uh, real food. So sure. you know, that's where we really want to create this rich food revolution. And we want to take into account all the ingredients and, and also the, the growing methods and the processing methods and, that a food goes through mm -hmm. before it comes to your grocery store. All right. So what is some of the grossest stuff <laughs> that's in <laughs> foods today? Because there is a laundry list of it. Well, I mean, we call them the banned bad boys Yeah. Um, because there are numerous ingredients in our food that are banned in other countries. And we're not expecting the government to make any swift you know, labeling laws or anything like that. And we just don't think it's, it's feasible for them to do so. We think that it's our, it's our right and to be educated, and that's what we're trying to do. It's things like azodicarbonamide. Mm -hmm. I mean, you'll see that on white bread, and you'll see that in things like, um, I don't know, all bagels, sorts of bagels muffins. and stuff like that. And basically, it's also in your sneaker sole. It's the same exact ingredient that Jeez. you use in a yoga mat. Um, it, it is a foam plastic. And it, it makes it so that the grain, the wheat, turns white faster. And in other countries, they just wait a little bit longer. <laughs> and it whitens naturally. I mean, things like that, that's pretty darn gross. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's BHA which, you know, the National Institute of Health says is reasonably anticipated to be a carcinogen in the state of California list as a carcinogen. Why we needed to preserve our foods, I don't know, especially since natural preservatives have been shown in multiple studies to work better than BHA and BHT, mm -hmm. which are both synthetic preservatives. But yeah. again, it's the manufacturers. They just, you know, they find it easy. They find it simple. It's being offered to them at their, at their contract manufacturing plants oftentimes. So they go in and they say, hey, I want to make X or Y it's even found in some multivitamins like Centrum. And they're like, well, this is this is how we make it. This is the ingredient list. Do you sign off on it? And they don't take five minutes to, to look at you know, what the ingredients are and whether or not they're going to have health consequences for the people who use their products. Yeah. And it's so easy for these companies to make changes. I mean, that's what's amazing is when, say, a company makes a product here in the U.S. and then they want to make the same product for, say, the EU, the ingredients have to be different because they're mm -hmm. illegal there. Right. So they're already making the product the, the way that we would like to see it be made. They're making it and selling it in another country um, with those better products. All they have to do is just give us the same rights that they're giving someone in another country, the right to save food. And the only way that we can control that is by not purchasing these things. Yeah. We get to vote with our dollars every single day. And if you buy it just out of excuse or laziness, all you are doing is you are keeping it on the store shelves. And we need people to realize that. Do not buy it. Buy only things you love because that's the way that we can decide how the grocery store, what the landscape of the grocery store will be of the future. Yeah, that's a great point. And it's already changing in, in a huge way in the past five to ten years. Trying to get organics or grass-fed or, or raw, low-temperature pasteurized dairy, for example, that was really difficult a few years ago. But now they're starting to catch on, and that's really exciting. And we're doing something else that is going to make it even more feasible for people to vote with their dollars. We're giving you guys coupons for all this stuff. We, um, we went to every manufacturer in the book, and that's hundreds. <laughs> that's a couple hundred different people that we called and said, look, your stuff is expensive. We know it's expensive for you to produce better food, but we want you to give people a reason to try your products. Yeah. 
And they actually came forward and they're giving us coupons. They will be on our Rich Food Resource Center at cultnutrition.com. And people can go on starting the 26th and grab coupons for grass-fed beef. They can grab coupons for, you know, great yogurt that's pasture-raised. Mm -hmm. They can get, you know, cheeses and all of their non-irradiated, all their organic spices. It makes it so it is feasible for the, for everyone to do. And that was really important for us to include with this book. Yeah. yeah. And you kind of need that hook, don't you? Like, because some, some people will say, yeah, I really want to try this and I want to be healthy. But they're looking at, you know, those little singles of American cheese or whatever next to the Kerrygold cheese, for example, and it's a lot more expensive. It still looks like cheese, although I guess you could argue that American cheese doesn't at all look like cheese. <laughs> yeah. But they won't they won't take that first step. And I know when a lot of people come over to to my place and I cook for them or they see what's in the the fridge, they're just like, wow, you guys are food nerds. You have all sorts of crazy <laughs> stuff. And you're snobs about it. And it's like, yeah, because like once you start eating this way, you just don't go back. Like you never want to touch a craft single again after you are used to eating rich, real cheese. Oh, yeah. It's oh, a waste. It's yeah. a waste of a mouthful. <laughs> it really is. I mean, that's one of the things, too, that's the, a sad reality of America, again, is that we've lost our relationship with food. Mm -hmm. You know, again, when we've traveled to these other countries, you see that their entire day is made up of, of – of, of, of food gathering, they go out and catch the food, they go, they clean the food, they, awesome. they, they make the food for their families, they share the food together, they, you know, it's all based on that. In America, we, you know, we're, we get up in the morning, we grab this, we don't have time for lunch, we skip meals, we, you know, even if we are sharing a meal, it's, you know, we're texting, we're on the phone, we're doing this, we're doing that, our minds aren't on it. And because yeah. we've lost that relationship with food, people like yourself and us who who've rekindled that relationship with food, when people come to our homes, they're like, wow, you know, who knew there was this great world of, it, not only is it interesting, it does it taste great, but then of course there's the, the added benefit of once you start to have this relationship, our health improves. Right. So, and one other thing we did on the Rich Food Re uh, Resource Center is we have what's called a rich food request list. And this is, I think, really one of the most yeah. important points uh, that we want to get across to Rich Food, Poor Food is that we're not helpless. And like you said, a few years ago, it was hard to find some of the foods that we all enjoy now in the grocery store. But with our request list, we've listed every rich food in the book. We've listed the UPC code next to it. So all a person has to do is print off the list, circle the foods they want to request their grocery store carry, and bring it to the manager hundreds and thousands of people across the country hopefully will download these lists and bring them in and within a very short period of time the grocery stores the manufacturers and the and the managers themselves are going to get a very clear picture of what the american public really wants in the grocery store and then like mira said leave the poor food stuff on the shelf stop mm -hmm. buying it and realize you are voting for it every time you're buying it when yeah. you buy it it's not just you saying oh well you know it's too difficult this time but it's telling the store is this is what i want and this is what i want you to stock yeah. and if you realize this then we really can start a rich food revolution and change the landscape of the grocery store absolutely and that's something that not many people do. I, I do it myself and, you know, no one wants to inconvenience the, the managers of supermarkets or whatever. But the, the truth is they want to give you food that you're going to buy. They want to give you food that, that you want. So they actually, in my experience anyway, you know, when I ask for low temperature pasteurized goat milk, which I just right. did actually from uh, a couple of weeks ago at this new market that just came in. Um, just a few blocks away from my house, and they're just like, "Oh yeah, I know the guy who supplies that. I'd be happy to bring that in next week." And I'm like, "Wow, like, that's awesome!" They, <laughs> they want to make it. They want to make happy customers. Yeah, yeah. And we just you know, we we tell people like, you know what? Print one off for yourself, and then print one for like a bunch of your friends, and say, you know what? Here's some great products. Let's all go in. If, if five of us, I mean, they do it for one couple. They do it for us all the time. Mm -hmm. But imagine the difference it can make if five people in your neighborhood do yeah. it, if 10 people in your neighborhood do it. They're going to really listen. And then it's not one neighborhood store. It's a city. And we can really make this spread and really make make the companies be forced yeah. to then make better ingredients. We get phone calls now from some people, some different manufacturers, asking us to look at ingredients before they put the, pet, the, the product together. Mm -hmm. Love that. Yeah, so and, cool. And thrilled to have that opportunity. <laughs> Absolutely. And going on the point that you were talking about before, being involved in the process of creating food in, in like, all day long in some cases, right? Um, especially when you look at other countries. It just made me think of how food is is kind of art in a lot of other 
countries. And in America, we tend to think of it as an, yeah. an inconvenience. You know, it, it's something that we're shoving down our throats because we don't have enough time to, to People focus on People don't eat it. in cars. People don't eat on camels. Right. People don't. You know, <laughs> you, you stop. You set up something in the desert. Everybody gets off. You sit down. You eat. You you set at the nice table. It is a it is part of a day. It is something to be to be enjoyed with friends. I mean, it's called breaking bread for a reason. Not that we want to eat bread, but <laughs> you're supposed to sit and share your food with somebody, have conversation. Yeah. I mean, this is really what food was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it nourishes your body. It nourishes your soul. It brings in value to your life. It's it's really a. It, it's looked upon so differently, especially, again, the more remote we go, it really becomes the center focus of the day. Yeah. And we love playing in the kitchen. I mean, once you start, I know you are in the kitchen as well. Totally. I mean, literally trying the different spices and the different flavors. I mean, that is just amazing. We actually did a salt tasting, you cool. know, at a dinner party just because salt has such different flavors and you don't think about that. Yeah. Um, there's so many ways to enjoy food, and I think once once people start buying better products, I mean, taste the chicken sometime between a real chicken and a store bought Purdue thing. Oh, it's nuts. But they're not the same creature. No. And I think if you just do it side by side once, you will realize one tastes like a chicken. Yeah. <laughs> in in the good sense. Exactly. Yeah. The other mom, one tastes like arsenic. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. My mom came over. She goes, "This thing is so chickeny." Yeah. <laughs> Like it's a chicken. <laughs> yeah, and it, it's funny too when people come over. They're just like, "Oh my gosh, what is on this chicken?" For example, yeah. and I'm like, "Salt and garlic." Yeah, <laughs> it's tricky. <laughs> yeah. But that's I mean, all it takes when you start off with a great chicken. That's, exactly, that's all it takes. A little bit of butter, salt, garlic. You know, that's and one of the things we we talk about often too is we want to get this message to the mainstream. Mm -hmm. We want to get this message out there, not to the few thousand people who already know all this information. I'm sure a lot of people listening to this podcast, not almost all of them, you know, are well aware of the good majority of things that we're talking about. But what about the 400 million people that live in America yeah. and that really need this information? So one of the things we're trying to do is get out there into the mass media to do the TV shows on Fox and to do the shows on NBC, ABC, and all the different news stations so that the average American can say, you know what, I'm not going to pack that check mixed into my kid's cereal anymore. Now I'm going to use, you know, Louise's 100%, you know, all natural granola. And that could right. be a better snack for my kid. And I can make small changes in my life. It isn't that difficult. I can understand what a rich food and a poor food is. And I think one thing that the book does too is it teaches nutrition in an environment that people are familiar with, the grocery store. This is a right. place we come into contact with food. Why are we trying to teach nutrition like a boring, doldrum college, you know, class? You know, it's <laughs> too complicated for that. Let's teach it in the place that we're all coming in contact with the food. Let's start at the basic levels and make small changes over time. Yeah. But oh, one thing, other thing point. is, although we're making it sound like, you know, it was, it's not for people that are listening right now, I have to say, I mean, I get questions every single day when I'm online on different Facebook um, paleo rooms about products. And I would say that a lot of times they're going to find products in this book that they didn't know existed, mm -hmm. that they wish they had been looking for for many times. Like, you know, everyone wants a sprouted nut butter. Everyone wants that. If you're going to have a nut flour, you might as well find one that's already sprouted and, and ground. And there's all, all of these things are in there. There's a million different products that people don't realize are available. Uh, and we really did, we went the extra mile and searched these things out and put them all into one place. Um, which cans have BPA? Because most of them don't label when they're BPA free. Right. Um, we're working with them to redo their packaging so that they will put BPA free on them just to make people aware of which cans are and which cans aren't. Mm -hmm. um, but we did all of that research. We've been in contact with every manufacturer and ask them the hard questions. So yeah, I mean, if you're if you're a person who thinks that you've got it dialed in and that you're doing everything right, I can guarantee you you're not. There's places it doesn't matter who you are. There's places that you can improve your food quality, even if it's just spices. Mm -hmm. You know, using non irradiated spices. This is an area where a lot of people fall down. They just think, oh well, I'll cook my chicken. I'll use salt. Well, is it unrefined salt or your spices? You know, organic spices because irradiation is something that every spice goes that that's not organic goes through or 
unless it's labeled Mm non-irradiated. And this is, you know, millions of chest x-rays, the equivalent of millions of chest x-rays that go through these spices, creating free radicals, then they sit on your shelf for, you know, six months or a year. Can further. <laughs> consistently creating more free radicals. So by the time you put it on your food, it's just it's just a, a disease causing mechanism. So yeah. it, so it could be even as simple as that. Or using shredded cheese. You know, people say, well, you know, I'll use shredded cheese. Well, what about the netamycin that's in it? That's an antibiotic mold inhibitor. There's potato starch in in that kind of stuff. If you're paleo, obviously this is something you don't want to do. It's been oxidized, so you lost micronutrient value there. So there's all kinds of things that even if you're, you know, an expert or you think you're an expert in nutrition, I can guarantee you you'll find little tips that can you could still improve on in rich food, poor food. Yeah, and I fall into that trap all the time. It's a double-edged sword because you want to eat obviously the best food and you don't want to stagnate. So one of the things that I do is, is I try to get a new, uh, you know, bar of chocolate every time I go to a, a whole foods or a natural food store. Cause they have so many different kinds and it's exciting. And they have, you know, <laughs> like the chili kind, cacao nibs and right. so it's fun to experiment. But every once in a while I'll come home and, and my girlfriend, Allison is a lot better than I am at, uh, at making sure that something is organic because sometimes I'll just reach for it and I'm just like, wow, that's a super cool flavor. I'm going to try this. And so I just grab it and then I come home. She's just like, this has GMOs in it. And I'm like, yeah. oh, no. You see that soy lecithin on the label and go, no, yeah. not again. And so it's it's nice to have a place where you can actually look for for brands that you can trust because they're so hard to find. And when you find them, you're so excited. <laughs> or at right. least I we am. actually, we left a place at the end of every single, we call them aisles instead of chapters. Cause that's how the book is organized by aisles of the grocery store. But we have a place at the end of every single aisle so that when you go grocery shopping using the rich food, poor food philosophy, you go down that aisle and you can write down what you found and it mm-hmm. cuts time at the grocery store because now you have your grocery list by the time you work through the different aisles. Yeah. Yeah, actually, one that I just found, uh, and the folks who listen to the show know that I do like dairy quite a bit, even though I follow, follow paleo as a template for most of the other things that I do. But I just found this brand. I think it's Kelowna. Um, yeah, Kelowna Supernatural. Yeah, that does such a great job because before, I did, like Whole Foods actually doesn't carry it, but um, we go from place to place, natural food stores in Austin. I found one that does, and we got this big old thing of heavy cream a couple of nights ago and I was so excited that I like made butter out of it we're gonna make ghee from that we made buttermilk and I kept a little bit of the heavy cream to put in my coffee and I'm so excited that I found that because yeah it's, no it's they're really... amazing and the cool thing is when they did made their um cottage cheese mm-hmm. they use Celtic sea salt which a lot of people don't realize I saw it's that very cool little bonus to that one I know and it's, it's also awesome. non-homogenized mm-hmm. so again super super added yeah, talking about Kelowna Supernatural, we love their organic sour cream too. It's organic, but it also has live active cultures like mm-hmm. soured cream should. Yeah. <laughs> it's very hard to find that. And it's so good. Isn't yes. it tasty? <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, I eat it by the spoonful. They're really good people. I've talked oh, to them for cool. I really like them as they I mean, they're so excited. And what we say is these food manufacturers, one of the cool things we're doing is in our blog, we have interviews with all the different manufacturers we've chosen. They get to say their likes and their dislikes and wow. who they are as people. Because yeah. that I, I think once you get to know why they're putting so much effort, I mean, these are not easy jobs. These are jobs that it is, they're, they're working thankless. tirelessly and it, they're yeah. just thankless jobs. No one goes and says, calls them up and say, wow, I really love your sour cream. You know? <laughs> um, I wish more people did because we, yeah. we do call them and tell them that. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, it's just fantastic. So I think people are like reading the blogs because it really puts a face to it yeah. and their personality. It explains why they're making them and how they're making them differently than other companies. That's I think a good point. Brings up a great point. And one of the things you have to realize, too, is that when you join the Rich Food Revolution and you're going out there and you're buying the rich foods and you're helping yourself, you're also helping those manufacturers. You're making it so that they can continue to manufacture their foods. We talk to people all the time. You know, the one guy, he he got on the phone. He's like, I've been making my organic hot dogs for yeah. nine years. I don't know how much longer I'm going to be able to continue to do this. You know, I can't no get them into the grocery store. Yeah. There's no profit. It's just a wall. It, but if people would request it, if people would buy it and people would support these companies, you're doing, you're doing 
great things. You're helping your health. You're bringing these products into the supermarket so people who may, who aren't as informed as you are going to start to see them popping up in their market. Rocky You're, Mountain Organic Beef Hot Dogs. Rocky Mountain Organic. <laughs> We're going to help this guy because he makes a great cool. hot dog. And you're, and you're helping these manufacturers to be able to produce the food. It's a, it's a supply and demand thing. We all know yeah. this. It's basic economics. Once enough people are buying them, the prices of the good foods will go down, or the rich foods, and the poor foods will just be gone. Yeah. Yeah, and that's as, in terms of a business decision, making these high quality foods is a bad one generally. It's a bad, <laughs> totally. Yeah. It's, it's not insane. good business, so we need to help them as much as possible. I was just talking to my brother yesterday, actually, who's an organic farmer in New Hampshire, and we were talking about the way that um, small scale farms, usually the ones that are supplying um, CSA food or farmers markets, you know, a lot of times at the beginning of the season, they're financing the whole thing on their credit yeah. card. And then trying to pay it off by the end. And, you know, anyone in business will tell you that is not a good way to do it. Um, and so they're just kind of like trying to survive. I'm sure the same is true for these small, um, I guess, consumer friendly food manufacturers. So we need to do everything that we can to help these guys survive. And, and a lot expand. of them are a lot. So, so true. A lot of them are trying to get into the big stores, too. I mean, Jones Creek Beef just got into um, Walmarts and wow. Costco's. And that's just Kroger. amazing. And Kroger. I mean, it's just so nice that these um, these companies are pushing so hard, and it's it's you know it's up to us to say and to buy it, yeah. to buy the product when it's in there. Mm -hmm. People say you can't get anything good at Walmart, Costco, those places. It's a lie. Yeah, there is starting a lot. To change. Absolutely. It's yeah, and in fact, I'm a big believer that Walmart is poised right now in a position that it could become a major, a global leader in these rich food products if they if they just decided they wanted to. They have access to you know people worldwide. They've, they're the largest company on the planet, and they are becoming more and more aware. I mean, they the, the Walmart brand. Dairy products don't contain RBGH. They don't put the synthetic hormones in them. Might they, not be organic, but they made a good first step. Yeah, they're not yeah. doing everything right, but they could do it right. If, they're, if the enough, enough people show them that that's what they're interested in, they'll make the change based on the financial benefit to them. They're a company like any other, so let's make it worth their while to, create, to have rich foods in the store. Yeah, wouldn't that be cool? One of the other things I like about your book is that it doesn't just focus, I, I suppose, because it's not a diet necessarily. It doesn't just focus on foods themselves. It, it focuses on drinks as well. And so I was reading the coffee section because, you know, I love coffee. Total, exactly. you know, like wannabe <laughs> connoisseur. I hand roast it at home and I always get it. I get the green beans organic and fairly traded uh, and notice a huge difference in terms of the way that I feel. It tastes better. It's better for the environment. Can you talk a little bit about why people should expand their thinking to also what they're drinking? Well, you know, one of the, my big, I, I'm a huge coffee fan too. If people don't know, I'm sure, I'm sure a lot too, but coffee is the number one source of antioxidants in the American diet. It's tons more than even green tea or black tea or even an apple. I mean, and not just a little bit more, but a lot more. One of the, my big pet peeves with Starbucks is they don't offer a single organic option for yeah. coffee. I can't go in and just order a cup of organic coffee. Right. And they're a worldwide company. And a lot of people think, well, what's the big deal? Why do I need to have organic coffee? Well, coffee beans are one of the most pesticide sprayed crops on the planet and you know you also want to find shade grown coffee because you know a lot of these genetically modified coffee uh, bushes now need sun and so they're cutting down the forest to create sunshine but at the same time that creates deforestation and all this other problems so you know it's important to, to have organic coffee um, just like anything else that you're gonna put in your mouth mm -hmm. you have to think about what it's going to give you like, what is the real reason you're drinking that? Because if you're just thirsty, there's water. Um, <laughs> but if you're, if you're just looking for something, you know, there's a lot of prebiotic drinks right now. You know, we love Kavita. Uh, first of all, it tastes amazing if you've never tried it. It does, yeah. It is so delicious. But it's probiotic. So, you know, if you're looking for something um, that's going to be low in sugar, uh, it has live active cultures, you know, that's a great thing. There's Kvass, again, amazing fermented beverages. Yeah, that stuff is good. It is good, isn't it? And that's the thing is there there are good options in every single aisle and you just have to be aware of why you're drinking it mm -hmm. and the fact that you're just not, you know, these have not, beverages can add a lot of naked calories um, into your overall day, which is, you know, what we do not want to be happening. We, we want to be able to say that all of the things that we're putting in our mouth are adding to our health. Yeah. And, day. and that's a really good point. You need to reframe the way that you're thinking about it. If you're thinking about... Um, just having a drink, then five dollars for kvass or whatever it is. It's, I've seen it at six. That seems yeah. really expensive. But if you think of 
it as being kind of a meal, right? Because of all of the of nutrients that are in there. Yeah, and it fills you up. Like that's that's a cheap meal. It's not an expensive drink anymore. Right. And, you know, they're, they're, what I like about rich food, poor food, too, is even we're not asking you to be perfect. If you've got a family member who's like, you know, I just can't give up the soda. I'm just not going to do it. You've, told, you've been talking to me about this for years. Stop preaching to me. Well, we've got soda in, in, the, in the drink style. We, you know, we talk about Zevia all-natural soda. Mm-hmm. They're mountain stevia flavor. It has no phosphoric acid. It's GMO-free. They use stevia as a sweetener. So, it, you know, it may not be perfect. I'm not telling people to go drink soda, but if we have a family member or friend who won't stop drinking it, it's a great option for them. Yeah. I'll confess, I had one last night and I enjoyed the heck out of it. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's one of those things, you know, we just want people to make better decisions in every single aisle. Mm-hmm. You know, if you want popcorn, there's, you know, popcorn that's made with olive oil. If you want a chip, you know, please have honest chips. They're delicious. There's coconut oil and they're made with organic potatoes. Um, there's something in every single aisle that is a better swap. And not a swap that only pays attention to things that don't really matter, like calories, like those people from Eat This, Not That. Yeah. We're, making, we're making the swaps for things that really will change your health. Yeah. Love it. Love it. So we're just about out of time, but why don't you tell folks where they can find you and, and find your book and what you're working on next? Well, they can always find us at coltonnutrition.com. That's C-A-L-T-O-N, nutrition.com. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming back on. I, I really appreciate what you guys do to push this into the conventional sphere because we need to stop just preaching amongst the choir and, and actually start affecting some some lives on a large scale, and you guys are doing a lot to help that. So thanks so much for coming on. You're welcome anytime. Thank thanks you so, so much. much. If you'd like to hear more from Mira and Jason Calton, you can check out the website at caltonnutrition.com. And just a quick reminder to hop on over to fatburningman.com, sign up for the email list, and I'll shoot you a free copy of the Primal Rockstars ebook featuring interviews with Mark Sisson, Rob Wolf, Dave Asprey, and tons more. We're scheduling some really cool interviews in the next few weeks with some unique guests who you haven't heard on air in some time. So stay tuned for that, get stoked, and I'll be talking to you guys soon. Be well.